Last time we met, we were talking about what would uh, happen if you added sodium chloride to an aqueous solution of silver nitrate. Well, now we know that silver chloride precipitates. It's kind of a white, purplish white substance. And then the two spectator ions, the nitrate and the sodium ion, are just in there. So you could filter out the solid material and you could find out how much you actually got from this reaction. So our first step is just to answer the stoichiometry question. What mass should you get when you start off with 2.56 grams of silver nitrate? Here's our equation. Is it balanced? One and one and one and one and one. Yep, it's balanced. All good. Start off with what's given. I gave you silver nitrate. You turned it two moles of silver nitrate. This is the molar mass of silver nitrate. The molar ratio of silver nitrate to silver chloride is one to one. And then the molar mass of silver chloride. So 2.16, three sig figs, three sig figs. That is your bread and butter, easy stoic problem. But notice that, should, that doesn't mean you do. That means that's what you theoretically should get. In a perfect world where nothing sticks to the beaker, nothing splatters, nothing gets stuck to the stirring rod, it all works perfectly. Well, in the real world, you never get this much. You always get less than this. So this is called our theoretical yield, what you would get theoretically if it was a perfect world. But what happens when you don't get that much? Then it's what we call the percent error or the percent yield. They're two different things. Here's percent error. It's a way to show me how accurate you are in your, in your abilities in the lab. It's also part of the lab grade. Here's the generic um, definition. It's the accepted, the absolute value of the difference between the accepted value, which is the theoretical value, and what you actually do in the lab, your experimental value. You take the absolute value and you divide by what you should have gotten, the theoretical, and then multiply it 100 by 100 to get the percent. We'll go back to the silver chloride one in a minute, but here's another example. Back in the day, we used to actually look up in a book called the chemistry handbook what these values were. Now we just go online. If you want to know the density of calcium, you look it up. It's 1.54 grams per cubic centimeters. Well, then you do a lab, kind of like the lab we did on the very first week of school. You measure the density of calcium and you get 1.29 grams per cubic centimeter. So is this more or less than what you should have gotten? Less. So this student's percent error is you take the difference between what you should have gotten and what you actually got accepted minus experimental, it doesn't matter which way you go because it's going to be absolute value, and then divide by what you should have gotten. So all you people who can do this stuff in your heads, 1.54 minus 1.29 is what? 0.25. How many sig figs in 0.25? 0.25 is two sig figs. This is the one place people make a mistake on sig figs, and this is about the only time we ever use a subtraction, is calculating error. So if this was a 2, then this would be a 1. How many sig figs then? Yeah, so it just so happens in this example, the difference was less than 1. And remember, when you subtract or add numbers with sig figs, it's always the digits to the right of the decimal that determines how many sig figs there are. Well, if the answer was 0.25, 2 digits, 2 digits, 2 digits, this has 2 sig figs. After you do the subtraction, then you count sig figs. So now we're going to divide a 0.25 by 1.54. How many sig figs can this be? Only two. That's the most common place for sig fig errors in our class, is when we do percent um, error. OK? All good? Now let's go back to the, the problem with the silver chloride. Same thing with the percent yield being kind of a measure of your, of your accuracy. It's what you actually got in the lab over the theoretical yield time 100, times 100. So remember, this is the result of the stoichiometry. This is what you do when you go into the lab. So back to this kid. So this theoretical yield was 2.16 grams of silver chloride. And somebody did the lab, and they got only 1.98 grams, so less than 100%, which is usual. What's the percent yield, and what's the percent error? Well, the percent yield is easy. It's just actual over theoretical times 100. So one, two, three sig figs. So our answer has one, two, three. Now what's the real quick way of doing percent error there? Just subtract it. From what? 100. From 100. So the percent error then is 8.3. 
and now we're subtracting numbers with, this could be 100.000, right? This is the determining factor here, one digit. So this is the easy way to calculate percent error from percent yield. So percent yield is what you actually get in the lab. The questions would be phrased as, a student did the experiment and got, that's the experimental yield. The theoretical is what you calculate in the perfect world on paper, okay? Valuable information gives you a ballpark of what you should be getting. Now there might be a time when you get more than that. Can you think of where? If, if there's a contaminant, you didn't dry your silver chloride, good, yep. Something else, you sneezed. <laughs> something else got in the beaker. But there's something that you don't see that reacts a lot with oxygen. There's oxygen in our water. There's oxygen in our room air. So we have, if we have pure metals, they're going to oxidize, and that's going to increase the mass. So you always have to be on the lookout for why did my mass, my actual, my experimental result come out higher? Well, maybe it was, there was some silver oxide in there because you had a little oxygen contamination. All good on this? Okay, now we're going to go to limiting. By the way, these problems are the ones that are in the homework. They're all here. If you like them animated, you can animate them to yourself. Something to do on the weekend. Whoops. Okay, limiting reactants. Last topic for this whole unit. This is like the so-called hardest type of problems. Limiting reactants. Oh, before we go there, last time we met, we made some ores. One ingredient was a limiting reactant. What was it? How come? Because it was more expensive. So those silver labs, silver chloride, silver nitrate, that's going to always be the limiting reactant because it's silver metal. It's expensive. It just happens to be an ion in those forms. So when I made some ores for you, I counted the number of students and said, I got 36, I had to have an even number. I'll buy exactly 18 Hershey bars and that is it, no more, because they're too expensive. So the Hershey bars were the limiting reactant. Now I make Hershey bars in my other class first and then you guys, and then I'm out of Hershey bars. So we are done making s'mores. You might like to eat a marshmallow toasted between crackers, but that's not a s'more, okay? A s'more has to have the chocolate. So limiting reactants in chemistry work the same way as how we did it for our s'mores. Iron, metal, and sulfur, this is a solid, it's a yellow powder, it's a non-metal, makes, what's the name of that stuff? Iron two sulfide. Now look at this, you guys, a solid and a solid. This is a yellow powder, iron, little tiny bits of iron. They won't react unless you do what? Heat it up, yeah, and then it becomes this. It's kind of a dull gray color. How many grams of iron two sulfide can be formed from 10 grams of iron? So when you see those kind of problems, there's an inherent assumption that there's plenty of the other thing available. So if I only give you one ingredient, you may assume that there's plenty of the other. I'm not limiting the other at all. Maybe room air. You know, we're not limiting oxygen in the room air in any way. So, but what if there weren't enough sulfur? Would you still be able to get all the 10 grams of iron to react? The insufficient sulfur would limit it. So it's one-to-one -one stoichiometry. Let's, let's change to moles. If I have one mole of this and only a half a mole of that, I'm going to run out of this. I'm not going to be able to make one mole of that. I'm only going to make a half a mole. So our job is to find the limiting reactant because this tells us how much product we're going to make. This is really powerful. It's the thing that gets used up first. Think back to the Hershey bars. They were done. And then, yes, we had crackers and marshmallows, but we were done making some mores. It makes the least amount of product. We still have um, crackers and marshmallows, but we can't make any more s'mores because we're out of Hershey bars. It makes the least amount of product. That we're going to exploit as method three. I'll show you what that is in a moment. And it determines the amount of product form. So if I bought 18 Hershey bars, break them in half, I'm only making 36 s'mores. So it limited and determined the number of product you make. So here is a very powerful technique. It's called variously I-R-E-I-D-A-I-C-E in general chem. If you have friends taking general chem, they call it B-C-A. 
before change and after initial during and after initial change at equilibrium however you want to call it ICE ICA the whole point is that you put down what you have initially what happens during the reaction and then finally at either at the end of the reaction or what we call equilibrium what the results are so this is an easy one you can see this one at a glance if we start off with two and a half moles of iron and three moles of sulfur, we haven't yet turned on the Bunsen burner. It's in a, in a crucible, right? It's a mix, but we haven't heated it yet. So we don't have any product initially. Now you can see which one's going to run out first. Which one? Iron. But that's because it's one to one. Well, how many equations in chemistry are one to one? Yeah. So these are really easy. But the same model will apply. So all of this is going to go away. This is what's going to get used up first. Only this much of that. And we will make the same amount because it's all one to one stoichiometry. And then you just add these up. 2.5 minus 2.5 is 0. 3 minus 2.5 is 0.5. This is what's left over. And you just have 2.5 and 0. So we call this limiting LR. Everyone who knows what LR is an excess. Okay. So it is our LR right here that determined the product. So this excess doesn't really do us much good, but we have to establish which one's LR, and sometimes we find excess first. I'll only ever give you two ingredient problems, or if it's three ingredients, I'll say the other is an excess, so you don't have to find one of three for the excess, okay? I'll always give you just two ingredient problems. If you find excess first, the other thing is LR. If you find LR first, you're good. You don't have to find excess. It's the other thing. Okay? So that one's easy. All one-to-one -one stoic. This is more likely. Three to two to three to one. What's this called? Uh, iron, iron, two iron two oxide. It's a solid. It's like rust. Aluminum metal. It's a solid. Iron liquid. So that means it's molten. It's, it's melted and aluminum oxide yeah not aluminum three just aluminum oxide it's also a solid so look here you guys 50 grams of iron two oxide and 25 grams of aluminum two amounts when i give you guys two amounts that's your key it's an lr problem and you have to do something a little bit different so do you all know who pavlov was famous psychiatrist he did a famous test where every time he fed the dogs he rang the bell so pretty soon, he would just ring the bell, and the dogs would just start salivating because they knew dinner was coming. So I want you guys to be like Pavlov's dogs. Every time I give you two ingredients, you've got to think ding, 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 start salivating. It's an LR problem. You've got to go through this extra step. The three approaches, the first two are identical. They're just in the reverse order. So it's not like you have to do three steps. The third one is the easiest, and I'll show you why in a sec. So here's that same problem, 50 grams and 25 grams. We're here. What's the first thing we do? Change to moles. So I just picked this one because it came first in the, in the questions, but it doesn't matter which one you do first. But notice how I laid everything out properly with units and labels. It really helps you. Now, if this were a one-to-one -one stoic problem, you could go 0.696 and 0.926 lower number. This is LR. Right? But it's not one to one. It's three to two. So you've got to compare one to the other. So I just grabbed the iron two oxide first, just because it's on top. Method two is I grabbed aluminum. So if method one and two are the same, they're just flip flopped. So I started with that. Oh no, I'm sorry. I started with moles. I put it here, and now I'm here. I'm comparing moles of one reactant to moles of the other reactant, which is aluminum. What you got on the bottom, what you want on the top, hit your calculator, 0.464 moles of aluminum required. This is how much I have. Is it enough? Yeah. In fact, it's like twice as much. So right there you establish this is what? The excess. The excess. So that means this has to be LR. So you don't have to do the other one. You've already established which one is LR. That's what we want. So that's how much we need. That's how much we got. That's got to mean that um, L aluminum is an excess and FEO, uh, FEO is in limiting, this one. So now you already started. You've already got moles calculated here. 
that's where you are here. You can just use the balanced equation, I'm sorry, yeah, the balanced equation molar ratio to find the product. Now we want to know how much product we'll make. I wrote it starting from grams. But you could have rewritten this right here. Okay, but just for instruction, I'm showing you the whole thing. Starting with grams of iron 2 oxide, here's the molar mass, here's the molar ratio, 3 moles of iron 2 oxide to 3 moles of iron. Where did we get those numbers? 3 to 3. And then the atomic mass of iron gives us 38.9 grams. So all it takes is one step, well, how many steps? One, two, three, four. Four steps to do method one or method two. So I just grabbed this arbitrarily. I compared it to the other. How much do I need of, of aluminum? I need 0.464. I've got plenty, twice as much, 0.926. That means this is excess, this is limiting. Start with your limiting reactant to determine how much product. Remember having all those extra graham crackers? We couldn't make s'mores because we were going to run out of Hershey bars. So that's method one. Here's method two. It's exactly the same. These two are the same. Look. And instead of FeO comparing to aluminum, I'm comparing aluminum to FeO. So this is just the reverse of method one. Do the same thing, comparing, this is how much aluminum I have. Oops, 926. It's two moles of aluminum to three moles of FeO. This is how much I need. Do I have enough? No, so right there you've established this is LR. So once you establish that, you don't have to do the other one and go, yeah, this is definitely excess. It's excess. So start with your LR. Same exact thing, get the same answer. But remember I said there's a conceptual understanding about limiting reactants, and that is it makes the least amount of product. We can exploit that, so instead of doing four equations, you only do two. Just treat them both as if they were limiting and see which one gives you the less product. There they are. Which one? The top one. So it's only two equations. So let's do it again. This way, one, two, three, four equations. More time when you don't have a lot of time on a test, right? If the question only asks, how much product do you make? Just do both of them all the way, and then compare. Which number is smaller? This one. So that means this was our limiting reactant. So this means nothing. This was just to figure out which one was LR and which one was excess. OK? Got it? Should we do another one? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh huh. And so in this type of problem, we don't use the initial during after thing? Correct. When, do you when it's all one to one stoichiometry. Oh, okay. So all through acids and bases, it's all one to one. Yeah. We'll use it a lot in stoic and, and uh, e equilibrium next semester. So here's another one. Um, first of all, a sample of 125 grams manganese dioxide reactor with 50 grams. Two amounts. What do you do? Salivate and say, LR problem, I got to use method either one, two, or three. Let's just say one or three. Does it say how much of the excess is left over? No, it just says find out how much you make. So just choose le um, method three, but I'm going to show you the, the other two methods too, just so we get it for sure. First of all, is it balanced? One MN, one MN, two, uh oh, uh oh, we need to balance the equation. And then for method one, turn both of these grams to moles. There they are. Just arbitrarily pick the one on top, MnO2, compared to the other. This is how much I need. Do I have enough? So what does that mean? Which one's LR? Aluminum. aluminum. So start with aluminum. Now, do you have to rewrite all of this? No. If you've already written this down, just start with it. It just saves you a little more time. Put 1.85 moles of aluminum right here, and then moles of aluminum comparing to moles of product, which is the mass of the manganese metal. It's 4 to 3 atomic mass of manganese. 
76.3 grams of manganese. So that's method one. Method two, I'm going to have aluminum here. It's exactly the same. I'm just looking at the second ingredient, comparing it to the first. I need 1.39 moles of MnO2. Do I have enough? Yeah, I got a little bit extra. So this is excess. This is LR. Well, we already established that from the previous slide. And then just calculate it. You get the same answer. But you know what? This question just says, find the limiting reactant. If you use method three, you find that out inherently. And you only are finding the metal of man the mass of the metal manganese. So just do this one. Look, two equations. You figure it right out. Aluminum is a limiting reactant. This one's nice and quick. Questions? Yes? So does it matter which method? No, I'm just saying, because I've noticed some people have trouble getting the test done on time, you, your, effort is, your, your best effort is to save time, right? So here's a good example, Neil. I could stop right here and go equal, and then calculate moles of aluminum, correct? And then I'd have to write that down over here, and then i multiply by the molar ratio, and I'd get an answer, and then I would write that down again, multiply by the atomic mass, and then get an answer. And each time you write it down, you have to round to the correct number of sig figs. That's time that you may not have during a test. So I'm telling you, I'm recommending you do it this way, all in one step, just because over the years I see this is what speeds things up. Also, what I've also noticed happens every year. Somebody makes a mistake transposing the answer from this first step down here. And it happens when there's a zero in front most of all. So if you calculated moles of aluminum from that first one, let's just pretend it's 0 0.00428, and then you bring it down here, what sometimes happens is that you're off by an order of magnitude. Every year, one or two kids in my AP class do that because they want to hit enter here and then write it down. But there's a, a danger of transcription errors there. This is just really quick. Do I have another one? I do, but I, I don't know that we need to keep going. Do you want me to do another one? Yeah. Aluminum burns in bromine to produce aluminum bromide. When six grams of aluminum reacted with an excess. Oh, well, this one's telling you. There's plenty of bromine. That much, oh, but look it. It wants the theoretical and percent yield. So it's something else. But it's not a limiting reactant problem because there's only one ingredient, one amount given to you. So first write the balanced equation. How did we know this was a liquid? Periodic, Periodic table. <laughs> it's the one of the two italicized fonts. So I took what I was given, the one ingredient, because I'm assuming, no, it says there's excess of bromine. This is changing it to moles of aluminum, comparing aluminum to aluminum bromide, two to two, obviously. And then this is the uh, molar mass of aluminum bromide, and this is what you get. Okay, that's our theoretical yield. Okay, now, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Here's what the kid got, or the whoever. This is this is what they actually got. That's what they should have gotten theoretically. So here's our actually got 50.3 grams. We should have gotten this 80 about 85 percent, three sig figs. And then, uh, did we have to, no, we didn't have to calculate percent error, but I think I did, didn't I? No, I did not. Mm -hmm. They said theoretical and percentage. So when you do the stoichiometry, that's oh, theoretical. Oh, okay. There wasn't, you weren't actually running this lab. Right. But then when somebody does it, when somebody reacted, it doesn't say who, this is how much was actually gotten. So that's the experimental yield. There's no theoretical. The theoretical yield is your stoichiometry result. It's just like the yep. Mm -hmm. That's what you should have gotten, and you'll never get that much unless there's a contaminant, you know, but then it's not a pure compound. Another one? How are we doing on time? Oh, we have to stop. Darn it.